All right, so we're in Romans chapter 5 today. You know, at Calvary Chapel, we like to go verse by verse through the Bible. So we come to Romans 5. And we've been studying, you know, up to this point in, in the book of Romans. And so uh, starting in chapter uh, 4, we started studying about salvation. Before that was sin, which was a pretty ugly topic in chapters around 2 and 3 there. But now we've come to a, a much more, uh, you know, wonderful topic to talk about, and that is our salvation. And if your Bible that you're using or your app that you're using has subtitles in it, you've probably seen uh, the word justification in there somewhere. You've probably seen that word. And that's really what we're going to look at closer today is what the Bible calls justification, uh, really kind of synonymous here with salvation. We have sort of an, uh, an intuitive understanding of what being justified means, I think, as, as we think about that word, because when someone is called upon uh, to defend their actions, they often will say things like that. Say, well, I felt like I was justified in my decision. You know, why I did this or that thing, I felt justified in that. And so we draw this connection between justification that the Bible uses and being right. We sort of make a connection there, uh, just intuitively. And so let's see more about how the Bible uses this term. Let's look at chapter 5, verse 1, Romans 5, 1 says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so let's sort of define justification a little bit more here. A justification really means to be, to be made right. We've talked about in previous weeks to be declared righteous by God. That's what we're talking about when we talk about justification. We've seen previously from the life of Abraham how God credited righteousness to him, and he credits righteousness to us as we accept Christ as our Savior by faith. It's not because we deserve it. It's because he grants it. That's really all there is to it. We don't, we don't deserve uh, justification. One way to think of being justified, I've heard, and I think is a good way to remember, uh, is justified as being just as if I'd never sinned. That's really what it's talking about. It's just as if I'd never sinned. It's justified. Through justification, God places us back into a right relationship with Him. The right relationship that Adam and Eve once held before the fall. He puts us back in that relationship. Think of how they communed with God in the garden. All that amazing stuff we think about was theirs. And they knew no fear of God before the fall, right? I mean, it's just like, hey, it's God. Great. You know, there was no concern whatsoever. It puts us back in that place. Isn't that awesome? That's where justification takes us. Back to that relationship that God intended all along and that He desires for each one of us. And as we uh, look at justification, we're reminded here again that our justification in verse 1 is by faith in Christ. It's because of what Jesus did for us. As Paul has laid out in the last few chapters, as we come to chapter 5 here, and as we think about what Jesus uh, said in John 14, 6, that Jesus is the only way. He's the only way to God the Father. The only way to find our, son, our home in heaven and eternity is through Jesus. Now, it's impossible to talk about justification without thinking about the results of Justification, Even as I've been talking about it, I'm talking about the results as I'm even trying to describe it. So let's look more at those results. We see that in verse 2, the results of justification. First of all, that we've entered into God's grace. And the word translated grace there, it's the common word translated grace in the New Testament, the Greek word. And it means that grace that brings joy, favor, acceptance, pleasure. Another definition is a favor done with no expectation of any repayment. So there's no strings attached to grace. There's no payback required to God's grace. We often think of God's grace in this way. It's defined as God's unearned and unmerited favor. Right? We have, we have no right to it, but He gives it to us. On the basis of Christ's sacrifice, God showers us with grace. 
I mean, as you think about it, it's kind of too incredible to fully comprehend. It kind of overwhelms your mind to think about what all God has given us, you know, just us, ordinary people. You see why then when God has done all this, when God's given his grace, when Christ has given his life for us and all this, that for us to try and add works to what God's done as being necessary for salvation afterwards is a huge offense to God. Right after he's given such a lavish gift, then for us to say, well, I'm going to try and earn it now, <laughs> is really offensive to God. He's given us something that we really have no right to, and yet that's where we stand. Anyone who's a believer in Christ, that's where you stand today. You stand in God's grace. You stand forgiven. He's given us a gift that really changes who we are. Right? We've been, we've been born again. We've been born again. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says that we're a new creation. We're made a new creation in Christ in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 as we come into salvation. He's given us a place now in eternity in heaven with Him as well. I mean, we were dead spiritually and now we have life. We were bound for damnation and now He has a home for us in heaven. How awesome, right? What a, what a transformation has happened. And so if we begin thinking that or acting like we have some part in all this, that we have some part in this salvation, that somehow our efforts on this world can add anything to what God has done, that's incredibly offensive to him, right? And really kind of naive, right? Of what the scriptures say about salvation. And yet we have to be on guard because our flesh will take us there, you know, unawares. Our flesh will kind of kind of lead us there, our pride wants to believe that somehow we deserve some of that blessing. Maybe just a little bit. You know, there, there's something so good about us. You know, we, we, should, we should get that. You know, we earned that a little bit, but that, that's a lie. You know, that is not from the Lord. Our salvation, our salvation is all because of God's loving nature, not because we deserved it or that we could earn it in some way. By contrast, in our verses spell out what we should be or what should be our response to this justification. It says there in verse 2, at the end of the verse, that we exult. And you know that word exult is not as common to us today. It really could be translated rejoice as well, right? Or celebrate even it could be that translation. And rejoicing in the light of God's salvation He gives us in the light of our justification, I mean, clearly is the most fitting response, right? To worship God because of what He's given us. Even as we just discuss and describe these things, it fills our hearts with joy to think about what God has given us. It says in verse 2 that we rejoice first in the hope of the glory of God. Now, in our common speech today here in American culture, when we use the word hope, we really mean wish, don't we? That's what hope, it's really synonymous now with wish. Like right now, we say, I hope it will rain, right? What do we say when we say, I hope it will rain? We say, I wish it would rain, right? We don't see any evidence that's coming, but we want that to come. We wish for that rain here in Texas. But that's not the way the word hope is in the New Testament. That's not what this, the Greek word translated hope here really implies. It does not mean wish. It's a hope with the expectation of receiving. We know that God will deliver, and we're looking forward to that. That's the kind of hope. That's what this hope means. It's not something wished for. It's something that's certain that's coming. And our hope is for the glory of God, it says. We look forward to the day that we'll be in the presence of God. Won't that be awesome to be in His presence, to experience His glory firsthand? I mean, just think about how amazing that will be. I mean, to, to help us sort of envision that, let me read from Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah 6, uh, starting at verse 1. This is Isaiah's vision there, of course. It says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with a train of His robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now just for clarification, when it says seraphim, those are, seraphim are angels. So just to be clear on what seraphim are, those are a type of angel there in the presence of God. And we're going to see this. Isn't that incredible to think about? We're going to see this. We're going to see God 
in all of His glory seated on His throne someday. That seems so far away from where we are, doesn't it? We feel like somewhat of like the desperate outcast or something here in this world. And from that position being brought from sort of the streets into these royal chambers, like what is this? I have no idea how to process all this, right? When I see the glory of God, we don't have words to adequately describe uh, what we see. We don't know how to feel about such splendor, and yet it's going to be ours to enjoy. We're going to be there in God's presence. We look also uh, forward to that day because on that day, sin is going to be a distant memory. When we're in the presence of God, sin is gone. In this life, as we've accepted Christ, God has made us His children. He's made us joint heirs with Christ, the Scriptures say. He's made us royal priests. Uh, Peter records in one of his epistles. But we get so bogged down in this life, don't we? We get so bogged down in it, battling temptation, battling our own sin nature, uh, dealing with just the, the toils of life, the difficulty, the 105 degree temperatures, you know, dealing with all these things can really get us down. And, and then there's the sin of other people that we're impacted by, right? As, as, as we deal with their fallenness as well as our own. We forget in all that sometimes who we are in Christ. But as we said, uh, study in the coming weeks here in Romans, we're going to see that we're not slaves to sin as Christians anymore. And we're going to see that we're more than conquerors in Christ. These are things coming up. I'm not going to delve into those today, but just to sort of whet your appetite, these are things coming. But in heaven there, to the glory of God, sin is not there and God's glory is there. We're going to experience all of that. It's going to be awesome. So it's easy to rejoice when we think about our blessings from the Lord, isn't it? It's very easy to rejoice. I hope it is uh, for each of us as we think about that. But we also, it says, starting at verse 3 here in Romans 5, we rejoice because of our trials, because of our tribulation. Paul writing here reminds us of a similar teaching in James chapter 1 that tells us to count it all joy when we endure tribulation. Now, it's important to realize that the rejoicing is not because of the pain. That is not what is implied. We're not to rejoice because of we're in pain. No one rejoices because of pain. The Bible is not proposing that we seek to be in pain, you know, that we just enjoy being hurt, and that's what we're going to seek out. And, and that somehow if we have a rotten life, it's more spiritual. It's not saying any of that. That's not what's implied here. But we rejoice that as we go through trials, there's good fruit that comes out of it. That's what we rejoice about, the fruit from those trials. And the first fruit it mentions in verse 3 is perseverance. Let me give you a definition I got off of Google for perseverance, I think is a good definition. The definition is persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. That again is persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. So we might say it's keeping at it. Even when it's hard, we keep at it. It's staying in the game, we sometimes say, even though it gets difficult. Now what will we be persevering in as believers? Well, we'd be persevering in godliness, right? In living for the Lord, in living in the way He would have us live. That's what we're persevering in. Even though we get frustrated sometimes, even though the bottom may drop out of our life sometimes, Even though from the perspective of this world, maybe there's no reason to hope. And when you look at it from a worldly perspective, think about Christians who have been uh, imprisoned up to the point of their death. From the world's perspective, there was no hope, and yet they had the hope of heaven. They knew that, hey, I'm going somewhere so much better than this. I'm not worried about it, right? I mean, that's really is the attitude we want to have. How do we do that? Well, it's by the power of God. By His power, we stay with God. We don't give up. We persevere. And I hope that ministers to all of our situations today. You know, that whatever's going on in our lives, even though it's difficult, we don't sort of cash in. Instead, we dig in. We cling to our Heavenly Father and trust in Him. Because we will see better days if we just hang in there. Now, some of us are a little more result-oriented in our thinking. You know, maybe you're a type A personality. I don't know everyone's personality types. I don't know how there can just be two, either type A and type B. That doesn't make sense to me. But we'll just say, you know, maybe you're a type A and, and so you may be more result oriented. And, and so in this matter of persevering, we think, you know, as long as I don't give up, that's what matters. 
Right? That's it. That's the goal. That's the, the result I'm looking for. I didn't give up, therefore I achieved the goal. Maybe I had a crummy attitude the whole time, right? Maybe, but that, that doesn't matter, right? That's what we think. I, that doesn't matter. Maybe I made everyone around me miserable as I was persevering. Well, maybe we think that doesn't matter too. We say, I still persevered, even though it was pretty ugly. I think about, you know, a lot of you know that I like to mountain bike. It's one of my hobbies. And a few weeks ago, I was, I was riding. And sometimes it's cool. There'll be families out there, you know. Um, and they're not riding on the, the crazy trails where the child could get hurt, so don't worry, you know. But I was riding on one of those trails, and it's very bumpy, but not really very dangerous. And there's a father and his daughter and his son. The daughter was probably like 13. The son was probably 10 or 11, something like that. And the father and daughter, they're just cruising along just great. And the son's at the back, and he is upset, you know, and he's riding over these rocks. It's kind of bumpy. Your bike's kind of going all crazy, but he's doing it great. He's, do, he's doing perfect. And I, I didn't get too close to him. I stayed way back, so he didn't feel like I was breathing down his neck. And, but I can hear him just saying constantly, it's not working. It's not working. It's not, the whole time he's like crying, it's not working. And I'm thinking, what? You're doing great. You know, he's like riding right through it. You know, no problem. But, you know, that can be kind of how we go through these things, right? We're, we're, we're actually doing it, but while we're doing it, there's just so much angst coming out of us, right? And that's not really what God has in mind. That's not what he really thinks about when he thinks about perseverance for us. Not that God isn't big enough to handle our, you know, our difficulties like that, but God cares more than the fact that we're doing the right things. He also cares about how we're doing it, right? He cares about the hows also. It's not just the what, it's also the how, and the case in point here in our verses, in verse 4, is that our perseverance is to be coupled with proven character, right? He says coupled with proven character there. That's what is to come out of that. And the Greek word that's translated here as proven character means proven or tried, uh, a proof of genuineness, a trustworthiness. That's what it's talking about with proven character. Uh, our elder Vince and I were talking the other day about uh, the workplace and the difficulty when someone leaves the job, it's been on the job maybe for decades or something like that, and the comment was made that you can't train experience, right? And you can't, you cannot train experience in someone. And that's what this, this verse is really talking about, right? That's what it's talking about. The word actually, proven character, can, can be translated as experience. That's another translation of it. It's having walked through the trials and stay close to the Lord through the whole thing. It's having that proven character that in the fire, we didn't run. We didn't turn away from the Lord. Even though maybe at some points it was ugly, we stuck with the Lord, right? We did the right thing, even when it was hard. And I think everyone who's a Christian, this is what we want said of us someday, that, uh, that we want to be those that when life got hard, we didn't freak out, right? We stuck with it. We stuck with the Lord. That comes then as we persevere in God's strength. We need His strength for this. It comes as we trust Him even when we don't understand what's going on or we don't see how it's going to work out the way we want it to. We don't see how it's going to work out in a good way. We still stick with the Lord. It comes ultimately as we see our lives not as our own, but really as the Lord's. That we recognize that our lives are actually His that we're living according to His will and what He wants for us. And with that, then we trust He knows what He's doing, even in those dark times. The Scriptures show us that God uh, has direct involvement in the trials we face in life. Hebrews 12.6 tells us that He disciplines those He loves. Right? And we don't understand how all that works together, man's free will and God's sovereignty. I'm not going to try and solve that riddle today. We know it's somewhat of a mystery of how all that works together. But we do know that God is involved there. Only what's going to come to us is what He has allowed. The 19th century pastor F.B. Meyer wrote this reflection upon this. He said, what a comfort it is that He, that is God, surrenders this work to no other hands than His own. I mean, that's comforting, right? That God doesn't sort of delegate this issue of life. Well, this person needs to be more godly. I'm just going to give this off to someone else to work on that. You know, I mean, God is actually personally involved in our, our growth in this way. I think so often we struggle to persevere and grow in character because we do get so wrapped up in what's going on in our lives. 
And this is why our times alone with the Lord are so important for each of us. As we connect with our God, you know, hopefully on a daily basis, it is such a reset from the chaos going on around us, you know, or maybe you know, in our homes or whatever. When we get a good, solid look at God, our problems invariably will shrink. That's what always happens. When we see how big He is, we realize how small our problems really are. And this happens because as we get in God's presence, it brings us back to hope. As it also says again in verse 4, it brings us back to hope. And now this word translated hope is the same word as I talked about before, the same Greek word for hope. And so we can, we can persevere, we can grow in godliness because we have this firm expectation of the goodness that God has for us, what God has planned for us. I've noticed that in seasoned saints, if you will. Those who are not just advanced in years, but also in their spiritual maturity. You see that calmness in their trust of the Lord, and it's so inspiring. That's the result that we're looking for in our lives too. This is what we want in our lives, that calm trust in God, no matter what's going on around us. Well, we've been looking at the fruit that's going to come from trials in our lives in God's design, the fruit that God is wanting to bring into our lives. And the question is, where does this fruit really come from? And I think verse 5 here has the answer. It's the Holy Spirit. Let me read verse 5. It says, And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, again, we're going to talk about sanctification in the coming weeks as we get to that topic in the book of Romans. But from our text today, the Holy Spirit is essential to this fruit that's going to work in us through our trials. Without the Holy Spirit, the fruit is not going to be there, ultimately. And notice the Holy Spirit was given to us, it says in verse 5. Jesus promised that. Jesus promised the Holy Spirit to us during His earthly ministry. In John 14, 16, and 17, John 14, 16, and 17, Jesus says there, I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth whom the Lord cannot receive, excuse me, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see Him or know Him. But you know Him because He abides with you and will be in you. Jesus says that we will receive another helper. And the Greek word translated another there means one of equal quality. Right? So it's not like this, you know, lesser partner in this whole thing. One just as good as Jesus is what he's saying. Just like me is what you're going to receive. And we know that from the scriptures. We know uh, the doctrine of the Trinity that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are co-equal and co-eternal. Right? So we know the Holy Spirit and Jesus are just alike and the Father. Although we'd love to have Jesus here, you know, bodily, so we could talk to Him face to face about our situation, we have the Holy Spirit within us, always available, living inside of us. Recently, someone asked me if, if our church believes in healing, and we do believe in healing. We believe that uh, that is a gift of the Holy Spirit, and we still have the Holy Spirit living in us, the same Holy Spirit that Paul had. But we recognize that God determines how He's going to work. He always works according to His will, right? And so if He's not doing a lot of healing right now, that's His prerogative. You know, all we do is follow Him in submission. Now, you know, this idea of God healing and some of these other sign gifts that are uh, mentioned in the Bible do, does make some Christians a little uncomfortable. The Those who uh, label themselves as cessationists, they leave some of the fruits of the Spirit or some of the uh, gifts of the Spirit are no longer in use. But really, there's no reason to believe that. You know, the gifts of the Spirit uh, may not be as used in some instances, but there's no reason to believe that they cannot be used. You know, that's God's decision, how He wants to work uh, today through His church. And so Jesus promised the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus delivered the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus always delivers. <laughs> he always comes through. Now, we know that the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside each believer as we get saved because of what Jesus just said. I read it from the book of John. But at Pentecost, we see uh, the visible representation of that. So I wanted to read that. 
from Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. And so on that day, as the Spirit came in power, uh, the disciples, they were gifted, in particular, to speak in tongues. As that chapter continues, we see why they were gifted in that way. Uh, there was a large gathering of people there in Jerusalem from all over the sort of known world that time. And as they began to speak, they each one heard them speaking in their own tongue. And so it was a result, that was the ministry God wanted to do that day. That's why they all were uh, gifted with tongues in that way that day. The Holy Spirit still gives us spiritual gifts. While I'm on the subject, I'll go ahead and read one more uh, section of Scripture about this. Because the Holy Spirit does give us spiritual gifts for ministry, but not everyone has the gift of tongues. I just want to point that out, because uh, sometimes there's confusion on that point. 1 Corinthians 12, 4, starting at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4, says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries, and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as He wills. And so all believers, everyone who's a believer in Christ, who's received Christ as, as their Savior, will have at least one spiritual gift. We don't all have the same gift, so not everyone has the gift of tongues, not everyone has any of these gifts. We all have different gifts from along that list is the point. And so we have the Holy Spirit, and, and that today as a Christian, coming back to Romans 5, is really evidence of God's love is what it's telling us. Right? That, that's how we feel that love. God poured that love within our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives also is what uh, assures our hope in God as well. From 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, it talks about this. 2 Corinthians 5 says, For we know that if the earthly tent, meaning our body, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will, be found, will not be found naked. For indeed while we were in this tent we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us a spirit as a pledge. And so, you know, the older I get, the more I understand these verses about groaning. I just, you know, I don't know if that's anyone else's experience, but I, I definitely, especially in the morning, I understand about groaning in this tent. But, you know, isn't it awesome to see this, that God has given us the hope of heaven, and God has given us His love in this life. And the Holy Spirit testifies of both these things. The fact the Holy Spirit has come into uh, our to live inside of us testifies of that. His presence in our life, from 2 Corinthians 5 there, is you know, a pledge or like a down payment on that future home we have in heaven. And we know the Holy Spirit lives in us. Anyone who's a Christian, you know that because you've seen the evidence of how He's changed your life how He's changed the way you think, how He's changed the things you are interested in doing, the things you actually do, the way you speak. You see how He's made that transformation that you can't explain in any other way. It's the Lord working in us. Well, just as certainly we know our future is secure with our God, just as, as certain as we are of Him being inside us. And so as we come to a, a close today, let's not lose hope. Let's not lose hope as Christians. No matter who's, you know, in our governments and so forth, you know, there's been a lot of focus on that here in Taylor in particular lately of what's going on in our local government. But let's not lose hope because of things we see that we may not always agree with there. 
No matter if we feel like personally we're on the top of our game or we just feel like we're struggling, let's not lose hope in that moment. We have a future with our God. We've been justified by Him. Our sins are taken away. That's the most important thing there is in life. When we think about what goes on in our world today, in our lives today, anything can be stolen, can't it? Our possessions can be stolen. Our opportunities can be stolen. Our health, even our life can be taken from us. But no one can touch that eternal home that God has made for each Christian. That home is kept in heaven for us. And given that's our future, we can persevere now, can't we? We can persevere because we have eternal hope. Let's close in with prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that because of what you did on the cross for us, we are justified. All of us who put our faith in what you did, Lord, who put our faith and trust in you, we are justified, Lord. Our sins are removed. And Lord, we just worship you for that. And we thank you that you have a place in heaven guaranteed for us today, a home, Lord, that's for us that will never pass away. And Lord, we pray for those who don't yet know you. We pray for those who haven't made that decision, haven't entered into salvation, that they could say, I don't know that I'm justified. I don't know that the Holy Spirit's in my life. We pray that that would change today, that they would confess their sin to you, Lord. Uh, They don't need to confess every individual sin, but just that they are a sinner like the rest of us before you and that they need your forgiveness. And we pray they would receive that today. They would receive your forgiveness of sin and enter into new life that you guarantee to those who will simply come to you in faith. Lord, we thank you that you make it so simple that even a child can understand and be saved. And so we pray for any who have not made that decision, they would make that decision today. Their life would be transformed and they would know for certain they have a place in heaven. And Lord, we just glorify you for who you are, the amazing gift that you give us of salvation. We worship you today in Jesus' name. Amen.